Roderick Jefferson is going to come up here in just a moment, but let me tell you a little bit about Roderick Jefferson. First of all, he's written the Bible on sales enablement. Sales Enablement 3.0, if you have not read the book, you need to, because it really is the playbook for sales enablement. But here's what he's going to do. He's going to talk to us today about how we take sales enablement and turn it into revenue enablement. He's going to rock your mind. He's going to blow your thinking. Welcome to the stage, my good friend, Roderick Jefferson. Thank you, sir. No pressure at all. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. First of all, I want to take a moment to thank Gerhardt and his team to, for all of the hard work they put in, to Aaron specifically, to Kerry. Thank you so much for pulling this thing together and making it all come together. Um, today, as Mark was saying, I want to talk about where are we going? Now, we talk about sales enablement, sales enablement all the time, and it's something that I love and breathe. But it's time for my baby to grow up. It's time to get to that next level beyond just sales. I think it's done a good job, and I'll quote um, Paul yesterday. If you ask 10 people what enablement is, you'll get 12 answers. And none of them would be inaccurate, but at the same time, none of them would be on point. And it's simply because sales enablement is the definition is based upon where your company is in a maturation cycle of growth. And I'll talk a little more about that piece. But let's start really simplistically on what does revenue enablement really mean? It's, to me, it's about connecting the dots. So think about an orchestra. You've got brass, strings, percussions, woodwind. They're all trying to play the right song. Well, guess what? Same thing happens in-house. You've got marketing, product marketing, HR, engineering, et cetera. And they all want to do this right thing for the customer. The problem is sometimes they're out of step. The notes are, are misaligned. Sometimes they're not connected. Enablement now, no different than that orchestra. You need one individual and or organization to step up, tap the stand. And now all of that noise and chaos becomes a beautiful sheet of music. That's where we're going. If we can get to that point of we've got communication, clearly, collaboration, and orchestration. If we can get to those pieces, now the world changes. Now the question is, oh, is he just going to stand up here and talk about theory and fluff? No, I want to tell about actually how we do it. Because I look at enablement as a marathon, not a sprint. It's not a one-time thing. It's not something you go and do and fix. And the biggest problem, I'll be honest, and I'll say it here and to the folks online, my biggest problem with sales enablement right now is that we have allowed ourselves to become the fixers of broken things and broken people. We've got to get out of that box. So now, from a revenue enablement perspective, I think there are kind of six pieces. It's enablement should be a part of your acquisition um, assessment and, and talent piece. Why? Because we get a chance to talk to them on a different level. We're looking at the propensity of them being successful in the role and also culturally, are they the right people? I define culture as what happens when no one is watching. We're looking for those pieces. The next piece then is all about onboarding and I'm not gonna give you a one-on-one. -on -one. It's about making sure that it's role specific because what's too technical for one is not deep or wide enough for another. And then from there, and we've heard this time and time again up on the stage, that's the everboarding piece. I see a lot of companies that focus on that onboarding, especially pre-pandemic when we were all exploding and we were growing, and now that things have trimmed down, now it's how do you continue to sharpen the sword for all of the people that you have in place today? And of course, there's the content management, the LMSs, all those pieces around asset management, but not from just the perspective of content, but really, how do we now disperse that content to the right people at the right time, and dare I say for your ICPs, on the right level? Then there's the coaching and reinforcement. We put a lot of emphasis on our ICs. Stop for a moment and remember that most of your leaders actually have never been coached and don't even know how to coach. We say, go coach, go coach, but how many of us in enablement actually stop and say, have you ever actually been coached? Do you know what coaching really means? And I don't mean telling them the way that you were successful and how you got to where you are. No, it's literally about stopping and not trying to peanut butter across the entire organization, but really talking now from a role-specific PC. 
Oh, here's one of my favorite pieces. Metrics and measurements. And I'm not talking about smiley sheets and butts and seats, right? No one cares that you have a 4.8 out of 5 for 5,000 people because that and seven bucks will get you a latte. It's really about trying to make sure that everything is revenue focused and ties back to things that are hard line measurables. The last piece is the succession plan. It's not just about growing people into the next level of maturation in their career or creating more leaders and, and excuse me, more leaders and, and less managers. It's also about making these people prepared to have a voice and a vote in their own direction of their career. I started out in sales. I was a BDR, I was an AE, and then what happened? I went to President's Club, things went well. What do we do? What do we do, folks, with your top sellers? Promote them to where? Manager. I said, no, thank you. And they thought I was nuts. Because I realized early in my career, I loved the process of selling, and I didn't get jazzed about taking down big deals. I said, what if, and I went to my sales leader, and I said, what if I could do two things? One, use the processes, and they were really basic and rudimentary. I'm not going to pretend like I had a process or a strategy. I didn't. I had a few small templates. But what if I could use those to get the other people that are coming aboard ramped faster? And the second thing I said is, you as a sales leader, what if I gave you the biggest and best problem that you could ever ask for? You've got more people going to club than you have budget for. <laughs> Everyone laughed. It's the truth. And he said, if you can do that, you've got a new job. I walked into training at the time. And it's worked out well. But now, to the revenue piece, it's about making sure we can align the dots, as I said, as the orchestra master, with all of the internal organizations, sales, marketing, operations, uh, partners, post-sales, and bringing it all together, especially on the post-sales side. We talk a lot about BDRs and SEs and solution consultants. Don't forget that as you're building that house and you're building this big, beautiful house, if you don't connect the dots for your CSM or your CS organization, you have built a beautiful, large house with a short hallway that people are going to tread out of the back door. How many people at a show of hands have a specific enablement organization focused on nothing but CS? Look around the room. We need to have people that own enablement for CS because what we've done traditionally is we try to give them the same information at the, right, the same level as we do sales. I think there should be a baseline for everyone in the company, but then it has to spread out like, like a branch on a tree because what's too technical or too deep for one is not nearly enough for another piece. And on CSMs, do we need to teach, and then this is a question by show of hands, how many believe that we need to teach CSMs how to sell? Nope, disagree. No, I don't think we need to teach them how to sell. We need to teach them how to help. I wanna change the mentality. Get them together and teach them how to help. Otherwise, we've all had this experience. It's 90 days before your renewal's up. Guess who's your best friend now? The CSM. If we talked and we taught them to actually help, that entire time, they're now building that relationship. They're building that rapport. They're getting and they're building trust. Now, how you do that better? Bring them in before the deal closes. I know it sounds crazy. Bring them in, otherwise you've got this white lab coat that you bring in and you're like, okay, I built a relationship with you, I trust you, you've told me what you're going to do and you've done it and now you're gonna disappear. What if you looked at your closest circle of friends, your tribe, personally in relationship, you said, I've got three new friends, we're not gonna hang out anymore. Thanks though, great for memories, we had a good time, but I like the new people a little better. That's what we do with CSMs. Stop doing that because you're doing not only them of a credibility disservice, but you're hurting your company as well. I think there's kind of four pieces here. What do we really do in this communication, collaboration, orchestration? Everyone says, oh, it sounds really good, but it sounds marketing. No, it's not. It's literally about revenue acceleration first. It's all about how do we get them on faster, accelerated to that point, and then increasing everything that they're able to do from a productivity perspective. The next piece is the important thing I was talking about around CSMs. Look, if you get the best logos in the world, or best company, should I say, in the world, and now you can't hold them, guess what you've got? You've got a leaky farm system now that you can't move from one to the next. The next piece is, and I want to talk to my marketers for a moment. 
Got a love for the marketing people for a simple reason. Um, and that is, how many times have we heard from marketing to say, we give sales all of these leads, and what do they do with them? Right? No one's ever said that, have they? Because sales, what's sales response to that? Because all their leads suck. See? <laughs> there it is right there. Now, let me, let me get to the next level of that. How many times you actually sat down at the same table and defined with marketing what an SQ or an SQL was? How many times have you said, what's the difference between an opportunity and a contact? Stop assuming back and forth. Sit down. And again, back to that orchestration piece, that's what we do. And the last piece is that communication and collaboration. Making sure that everyone is on the same page, on the same bus, and you know what? More importantly, that we sit next to each other on the same bus. So that's all good and well. How do we do it? Let's talk about the strategy piece. Everybody wants to talk about sales process, or they want to talk about your sales stages, or let's talk about our sales methodology. Or even more importantly, let's talk about the selling motions. Newsflash, you don't talk about the buyer's journey and you start there and build everything, you'll get no new clients, no new customers. Because too many often, too often, too many times, we try and shoehorn all of our prospects into the way that we want them to buy. Sure, we call them sell stages. How about we flip that on its head and said, why don't we find out who buys, how they buy, is it committee, how many people are involved, why do you buy? And if it's fed or sled, what's your buying season? And then build all those other pieces around that. And how do we do it now? Let's get even closer to the ground. It's time to recalibrate. Sit down and discuss your ICP right now. Well, not what it looked like a year ago, not what it looked like pre-COVID, but right now, based upon where's the company going next? Are there new releases that are happening? Have we changed our ICP? Has there been acquisitions gone on the market? Has there been collapses? I guarantee if you go sit down right now, unless you have done it in the last six months, that your ICP of where you used to be, I guarantee it's probably not on target right now. And why? Going back to that buyer's journey. I talk as a consultant with a lot of companies. The first question I ask is, can you articulate the buyer's journey for me? Rarely does it happen. Oh, everyone's like, oh yeah, we know who buys, we know how they buy. Okay, talk me through the buyer's journey. Talk to me from the perspective of when and how they buy and why they buy. Time to flip that around. It's time to deepen those relationships between sales and HR. Let's not leave out our L&D folks, right? Because if we don't set this up as folks are coming into the company of we now have a culture of learning, that should happen on the very first day with HR L&D. Now, too many times I've seen where it's you go to the orientation, stop, turn you over to sales, stop, I'm going to turn you over to your leader. How about if we just sat down at the same table and said, instead of doing it as a handoff, why don't we do this as a full continuous circle so that it's constantly happening and it's done collaboratively. Then after you've done that, now you can go and reassess all of those other things I talked about, the methodology, the stages, and all of those pieces. And now that you've done it over and you've fixed it all over again, let's talk about accountability and ownership of who owns what Let's talk about what are the metrics of success. And let's start the conversation with what does success look like for all of us collaboratively? And now let's reverse engineer that and do it backwards. And it also starts with this piece. Please stop teaching people how to give presentations and stop the whole, oh, we need you to learn the pitch. You know what that pitch does? It teaches them to have a one-way conversation. And it teaches to say, go in and I want you to go sell. Again, as I said earlier, stop selling and start helping. If we now start with a deeper level of prep on the front end, too often people want to go, as I go and look at the 10K, I go look at the 10Q, I go read their um, website. If you stop right there, guess what? You've only got half of the equation. Because what is most important is the relationship pill. The one question I would like to hear more from sales 
folks, when they're out talking to prospects, is asking this single question. Because we always find out what's going on with the company, what are your goals, what do your metrics look like, where are you going this year? There's one question, though, that rarely gets asked. So, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, how can I help, by having the relationship with my company, help you personally? Get you out of the doghouse, get you a promotion, get your name up in lights, move you into maybe a different role or a different level. Because once you do that, now you're actually talking directly with this person, not talking at them about what's going on with their company, which goes to the, collab the communication piece. It's making sure that you say what you mean, you mean what you say, and then you follow up on that. And the nurturing piece is critical. All too often, I'm going to give you all the big guns, I'm going to give you everything that I can up front. But once you sign, guess what? It's time for me to move on to my next one. No, it's just like a personal relationship of friendship, right? What you do in the very beginning is going to set the foundation of how that relationship goes going forward, either on a positive or a negative position. And we always say we want to create customers for life. How do you do that, though? Whoever teaches you that piece? It's pretty simple. It comes down to the continued nurturing. It's like having a, a relationship with your spouse. If you dated up to the point to where he or she says, I do, and then suddenly you walk away and you're like, okay, that worked. Guess what happens? 50% divorce rate. That's what happens. But if you never stop dating, this goes on for a long time. I will say, I've got a friend in the office, audience today. We have been friends for 42 years. We went to high school together. And the thing I want to say is, and I want to go off just for a moment, I want to say thank you for coming today because you didn't have to do this. I appreciate you taking time. And the reason I say that is that's a nurtured relationship for 42 years. We may see each other once every couple or few years. But what matters is the relationship still strengthened and it still continues ongoing. Playbooks. Oh, I love that look out in the audience. We're like, yeah, playbooks. And I think it's because we look at playbooks as just simply an asset, as opposed to looking at it along the way and ultimately seeing it as a guided learning process now. Because if you're doing it right, it's going to have two components to it. It'll have the, the normals of what do you do and how do you do. But it also has that piece of the collaborative pieces across all of the different lines of business and also what's the interaction and the most important pieces, what are the rules of engagement for each of those? When do you step in? Why do you step in? How do you step in? So we've talked about strategy. Let's go on to the architecture. Think my five Ps I want to talk about. And the purpose, the people, the programs, the performance, and the platforms. We all talk about these. I think to me, the purpose is critical. You've got to know where you're going, who are you going, how are we going to get there. To me, I think all of us are enablement for a simple reason. We're people people. We are here to make others bigger, faster, and stronger. And it's that people person, excuse me, that people perspective that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. We're so worried about connecting the dots with tool stacks and all the other pieces. Don't forget at the end of the day, it's why we do. There's the programs and those things from the onboarding and the, through ever, ever boarding as I talked about, right? Performance, not just from a metrics perspective, but from a human empathetic perspective of how do we constantly sharpen the sword for these people and continually grow them. And then at the end of the day, it's do we have the right tool stack in place and why is that important and how do we utilize it, right? And I call it demystifying the, the dark matter, right? It's about how do we align these? I think there are six categories traditionally that has to be in place for every enablement <clears throat> excuse me, organization. Not all at the same time and not all right up front. But I think it's that LMS, that content management piece, that then leads into your sales reporting piece. Got to have your automation tools and a plethora of communication tools. Of course, the sales, enabled, the sales engagement platforms. And then finally, the revenue intelligence pieces. Now, that all worked traditionally. We all know the world has changed. So not that it's not difficult enough for enablement folks to try and keep up with all this. And by the way, nobody needs all of that all the time. It goes back to that maturation point of where your company is. Just because it's the cool, the hot, the sexy thing doesn't mean that it'll work for you. Because my peers are using it does not necessarily mean that it's the right thing for my company. So now you throw in Gen AI. How's that work? I think there's kind of six ways to do this. One is let's now connect the dots with 
sales and marketing even closer, as I talked about earlier, starting all the way back with lead scoring. And now what does that do? It makes marketing inclusive in the overall sales cycle as opposed to simply be the people that grab the information and then pass it over to sales. The next piece is taking care of and, and removing some of those mundane tasks that are out there um, and actually giving our salespeople an opportunity to go and do what they do best. Tied back to analytics, right? Anyone that has done this any period of time, remember the time we could run a boot camp and it would take a day or two to get all the analytics together with all the feedback and all the metrics. Now, it's done like that. And now that gives you an opportunity to really work with your sales leaders to work on, and I will stress this word, personalized sales coaching, right? Improving and finding those soft spots inside of the sales process that can be automated. And then finally, all of the, the automated communications. But that's not enough. I want to talk about the high, right? We all talk about chat GPT, right? As though that's the only AI tool. Can you tell me which box chat GPT is up up there right there? Anyone? <laughs> all of them, as you say, Brian, right? But I wanted to put it for another reason. That thing was actually done back in February. Imagine what it looks like right now, right? Smaller font size and a whole lot more tools. It's growing constantly. If you are not in some way, and I got this from John Burroughs, if you're not from, or excuse me, from Kerry V on this one, if you're not using AI in some way every single day, you're not moving forward, you're automatically moving backwards towards the dinosaur world. And we all know what happened to them, right? So how do we leverage it as enablement practitioners? In the accreditation, the certifications, right? An opportunity. I know a company now that that's all they do is they have an AI tool that literally watch, excuse me, walks your sales folks through a number of guided scenarios that, depending upon the uh, question tree, you will either go forward or you'll go into a rabbit hole. Now, why would you want to do that? Why? Because you get a chance to practice and slip and fall at home because we are far more forgiving than when you get out there. And then also with the repetition, with confidence comes confidence, right? And with confidence comes confidence. If you get that done in-house, by the time you get out there, there are very few scenarios and questions that they haven't run into. In the role play pieces, as I was talking about, content curation, everyone thinks about that piece. I think that that's the one piece where we all go, okay, that makes sense. But beyond that, what about making sure that there's stronger collaboration, sharing best practices and um, feedback and tabulism and those things across Different lines of business, the intelligence tool. We all know about the, and the gongs and the choruses, but it's how do you utilize that piece to now take that back and put the accountability, the ownership, and most importantly, the positive modeling of this. I'll fill it out for folks that are taking pics. Um, the positive modeling of owning that for your first line manager. We know what's important to your manager is imperative to you, right? And especially people that are aspiring to sit in that big chair as a, as a sales leader, the best thing you can do is emulate through that through your own actions, not through your words. And then there's, of course, all, all the different typos, the call, the call uh, scripts, the demos, the mutual success plans. All those things now can be automated. And at the end of the day, you know what it really does? It creates more time. As um, Mr. Gilder said yesterday, to give people more time to actually do what they were hired to do, which is go out there and help folks and help grow the company. Because we are literally the translators of dialects and languages. What do I mean by that? I've got to go and I've got to understand Spanish, French, German, Swiss, et cetera. Because now I've got to go and I've got to go talk to each of those leaders in their language. Rule number one, please stop talking sales enablement ease out there and revenue enablement ease. Learn their language and how do they speak. And I'm going to fly through these relatively quickly. If I'm talking to sales leader, I think, first of all, there are two different types and sets of metrics. One is things that we impact and influence. The other is things that we own. Now, and I've highlighted what I have seen and, and seen sales leaders use and utilize the most over my career in the, as far as metrics and measurements, right? Productivity-wise, we own those pieces. We act, actually impact and we influence those. Don't get yourself in a situation where you're signing up for things that you cannot control that we can only impact. If I'm talking to a sales engineer, that's my German, right? I've talked my French to, to sales. Engineers, they don't care about the things we just threw up. Now they want to talk about demos and opties and POCs and length up and how many, those kind of things. That's critical. Same pieces we act, 
actually influence? What if I'm going to go talk to customer success? And I start talking about those other things. They're going to look at me like I've got 12 heads because they could care less about that. Now I, they want to talk about adoption rates and churn rate and escalation rates and making sure that we can trim down um, red accounts and CSAT and these kind of things. But what if I leave and I go and I talk to other pieces of the organization? None of those things will in remotely matter to them. Get to know, and I'm not talking about the basic of get to know your audience. No, get to learn your audience's language. And in some cases, their love language of what really matters to them, and then adopt your processes, your programs, your platforms, et cetera, because we're all looking at adoption rates and how do we drive that higher. It's simple. One, don't ever give anything that you think they need. Secondly, make sure that your leaders are a part of the build as well as the ownership, the adoption, and the positive modeling. And the third piece is only speak to them in their language. It's kind of like going over to Europe and saying, man, everything is small here. The portions are different in, at my size. The shower hits me in, in my shoulder blades. And then I have to remember, it's because I'm not back in America. So I have to go in and go and immerse yourself no different than if you were someone that was out there touring on vacation or on holiday. Immerse yourself with your lines of business. And I'm going to go through here relatively quickly, and I'll just fill this out quickly. Five reasons to translate from sales into rev enablement. First, it's going to vastly improve the level of communication, collaboration, and orchestration that I talked about. The next is it now gets you to understand your internal customer. I don't even call them stakeholders. I call them internal customers because I've got to treat them at the same level that I would out and about anywhere else, right? And then it's about the alignment, becoming or making yourself the orchestra master across all the lines of business of connecting the dots which now brings into not just empowers, but engulfs corporate, excuse me, customer success as a part of the overall go-to-market strategy. And then finally, everything has to tie back to revenue generating metrics. I will be out at three this afternoon at the Allego booth right around the corner. And I will be signing copies of my book, which goes far deeper than the pieces here. And to be able to answer any questions that you have or thoughts that you've come out of this thing and hopefully it's something that you can use. My job here is not just to kind of throw things out. I wanna give you things you can go back, put into practical application right now today and change even in the smallest way of the way either we used to do things or if you can help me, go back and focus on one thing. We're gonna kill, if you can help me with this one. Help me kill this statement. This is the way we've always done it because what used to work before a, no longer exists in most cases. And secondly, it won't work. Go back, kill the whole enablement ease, and go back and get to know your internal customers, not your stakeholders. So with that, I hope that I've given you something. If you would, please just take a moment and, and hit the uh, QR code. Give me some feedback so that I can also make sure that I can adjust this. And I can get information back to you post this conference because it's going to ask you a few questions. And if there's questions you've got that I can answer, connect with me on, I've got my LinkedIn tree here. You can find me on um, LinkedIn, on Instagram, etc. But I don't do this because I enjoy the spotlights because first of all, you can't see a damn thing up here. <laughs> I know a lot of people have said it. I do it because I absolutely love enablement and I love helping other folks that are inside of our tribe. And that can be sales, marketing, CS, etc. But if I can help you in any way, reach out, hit me on LinkedIn, let's connect. For that, I am truly honored and thank you for the time and have a fantastic rest of the sessions.